See, we see a completely non-racial society. We don't believe, for instance, in the so-called guarantees for minority rights, because guaranteeing minority rights implies the recognition of portions of the community on a race basis. We believe that in our country there shall be no minority, there shall be no majority, there shall just be people. And those people will have uh, the same status before the law, and they will have the same political rights uh, before the law. So in a sense, it will be a completely non-racial non egalitarian society. But will the vast number of blacks, after all their experiences, yes. be able uh, to live a life without giving vent to feelings of revenge, of... Uh, uh, yes, we, we believe it is the duty of the vanguard political movement which brings about change to educate people's outlooks. I mean, in the same way that blacks have never lived in a, a socialist economic system, they're going to live to learn to live in one. In the same way that they've always lived in a racially divided society, they've got to learn to live in a non-racial society. In the first interview, recorded in South Africa before his detention, Steve Biko himself talks about the development of the black consciousness movement and his vision of a future South Africa. The first part of the original interview was cut off. The interviewer first asks Biko what black consciousness is. Biko replies, Black consciousness is a political, cultural philosophy employed by blacks in South Africa in an effort to shake off shackles of mental oppression and to reinstate the essential humanity and pride of blacks. It was first devised by groups like SASO, the South African Students Organization, and the BPC, the Black People's Convention, in 1967-68, and has since filtered through to other organizations operating at various levels. Here the interview picks up with Biko's voice. Now the history of it uh, starts off after 1963-64. If you remember this era, uh, there were many arrests in this country which stemmed from underground activity by PAC, by ANC, and this led to some kind of political emasculation of the black population especially, with the result that there was no participation by blacks, in the articulation of their own aspirations. The whole opposition to uh, what the government was doing to blacks came in fact, in fact from white organizations, mainly student groups like Newsers, the Liberal Party, the Progressive Party, and blacks who were articulated in any sense were far uh, few by comparison to the olden days. And they were dispersed amongst these particular organizations. Now, when I came to university, which was sometime in 1966, in my own analysis and that of my friends, there was some kind of anomaly in this situation where whites were in fact the main participants in our oppression and at the same time the main participants uh, in the opposition to that oppression. It implies therefore that at no stage in this country were blacks uh, throwing in their lot in the shift of political opinion, uh, the arena was totally controlled by whites in what we called uh, totality of white power at the time. So we argued that uh, any uh, changes which are to come can only come as a result of a program worked out by black people. And for black people to be able to work out a program, they need to defeat the one main element in politics which was working against them and this was a psychological feeling of inferiority which was deliberately cultivated by the system. So equally too, the whites, in order to be able to listen to blacks, needed to defeat the one problem which they had which was one uh, uh, superiority. Now the only way to come about this of course was to look anew at the black man in terms of what it is in him that is uh, lending him to denigration so easily. So first of all, we said as black students, we could not participate in multiracial organizations, which were by far uh, white organizations, because in this country there is an overwhelming number of uh, white students at university. Uh, and secondly, these organizations were concentrating mainly on problems which were affecting the white student community. 
And thirdly, of course, when it came to political questions, they were far more articulate than the average black student because of their superior training. And uh, because of their numbers, they could outvote us on any one issue, which meant that Musa's, as an organization, gave uh, political opinions which were largely affected by the whiteness of that particular organization. So then in 68, we started forming what is now called SASO, the South African Students' Organization, which was firmly based on black consciousness, the essence of which was for the black man to elevate his own position by positively looking at those value systems uh, that make him distinctively a man in society. Like what? Um, first of all, we were of the view that this particular country um, is almost like a, an island of Europe in Africa. Uh, if you go throughout the whole of Africa, um, you do find aspects of African life which are uh, culturally ele elevated throughout the continent. But in this particular country, somehow, uh, any visitor who comes here tends to be uh, made to believe almost that uh, he is in Europe. He never sees blacks except in a subservient role. And this is all because of the cultural uh, dominance of the particular group which is now in power. Now, to what extent have you been successful? Um, well, we've been successful to the extent that we have diminished the element of fear in uh, the minds of black people. Uh, in the period, you know, 63, 64, 65, 66, black people were terribly scared of involvement in politics. The universities were putting out no useful leadership to the black people because everybody found it more comfortable to lose himself in a particular profession to make money. But since those days, uh, black students have seen their role as being primarily to prepare themselves for leadership roles in the various facets of the black community. And through our political uh, articulation of the aspirations of the black people, many black people have come to appreciate, in fact, the need to stand up and be counted against the system. There is far more political talk now, far more political debate, and far more uh, condemnation of the system from average black people than they have ever been since possibly 1960 and before. I'm referring here to the whole oppressive education system that the students are talking about. Uh, and after complaining about this, police, in fact the government, wants to further entrench uh, what the students are protesting about by bringing in police and citizens and dogs uh, and uh, almost soldiers, so to speak. Now, the response of the students then was in terms of their pride. They were not prepared to be cowed down, even at the point of a gun. And hence, what happened, happened. Some people were killed, and this riots just continued and continued. Because at no stage were the young students, nor for that matter, at some stage their parents, prepared to be scared. Now, everybody saw this as a deliberate act of uh, oppressive measures, you know, to try and cow down the black masses, and everybody was determined equally to say to the police, to say to the government, we shall not be scared, you know, by your police, by your dogs, and by your soldiers. Now, this is the kind of, you know, lack of fear one is talking about, which I see as a very important uh, determinant in no, political action. Since last June, something like 400 young blacks were killed. 499, actually. 499. Mm. And you think that this will not be a deterrent? No. I think it has been a very useful uh, weapon in urging the young and the old. I mean, before then, there was obviously a difference uh, in the outlook of the old generation to the younger generation. Uh, the younger generation was moving too fast for the old generation. The old generation was torn between Bundestag politics on the one side, old allegiances, uh, which were not progressive allegiances, you know, to groups like ANC, PAC, without any result in action. And there were those who were simply too scared to move. You but condemn uh, Bundestag leadership altogether? Yes, of course. We condemn Bundestag leaders. Uh, even the best of them, like yeah, that. Yeah. Well, uh, just say a few words on that. Well, our attitude here is that uh, 
you cannot, in pursuing the aspirations of black people, operate from a platform which is meant for the oppression of the black people. Now we see all these so-called Bannerstein platforms as being deliberate creations by the nationalist government to contain the political aspiration of the black people and to give them pseudo-political uh, platforms to direct their attention to. Now men like Gacha Buchelezi, Machanzima, Mangope and so on are all participants in the white men's game of holding the aspirations of the black people. Now, <clears throat> we do not feel it is possible in any way to turn such a platform to useful work. We believe the first principal step by any black political uh, leader is to destroy such a platform and destroy it and you know, without giving it any form of respectability. So once you step in it, once you participate in it, whether you are in the governing party or the opposition, you are in fact giving sanctity to it. You are giving respectability to it. So in a sense, people like Gato Buchelezi, like Matanzma and like Mangope, are participants in a white man's game. And they are participants at the expense of the black man. And they are leading black people to a divided struggle, to speak as Zulus, to speak as Tossas, to speak as Berries which is a completely new feature in, in political life of black people in this country. We speak as one combined whole, directing ourselves to a common enemy, and we reject anyone who wishes to destroy that unity. Yeah, we, we are, as I was saying, of the view that um, we should operate as one united whole towards uh, attainment of an egalitarian society for the whole of Hazania. And therefore, any entrenchment of tribalistic, racialistic, or any form of sectional uh, outlooks is abhorred by us. We hate it, and we seek to destroy it. And it is for this reason, therefore, that we cannot see any form of coalition with any of the Bannerstein leaders, uh, even the so-called best of them, like Gacho Buterezi, because they destroy themselves by virtue of the kind of argument that one has put up. So the government, of course, as you know, says that all this unrest really is due to communist agitation. Are you a communist? We are by no means communists. Uh, neither do I believe for a moment that uh, the unrest is due to communist agitation. I do know for a fact that um, there has been participation, it would appear anyway, from science, by a lot of people in the unrest. But the primary reason behind the unrest is simple lack of patience by the young folk with a government which is refusing to change. Refusing to change in the educational sphere, which is where they were directing themselves, and also re refusing to change in a broader political situation. Now, when this young chap started with a protest, they were talking about Africans, they were talking about bandy education, and they meant that. But the government responded in a high-handed fashion, assuming, as the world is done, that they are in a situation of total power. But here for once they met a student group which was not prepared to be thrown around all the time. They decided to flex their muscle and of course the whole country responded. Simply because I was still saying that um, there are lessons to, to be gleaned from this whole unrest situation of last year. In the first instance, I think uh, blacks have flexed their muscle a bit and they now know the degree of dedication that they can find amongst their own members when they are called to action. And they now know the kind of response they will get uh, from the various segments of the population, the youth, the oldies, and so on. And the second lesson, of course, is the response from the government and the white population at large. The government responded in one way and the white population also in another way. Uh, one doesn't want to get into details here, but you know, uh, reading news newspapers, you get some kind of idea of the extent of fear that was prevalent in white society at a particular time, especially just after the first onslaught in Soweto, uh, where there was a real fear throughout the community, throughout the country. Nobody knew just where something would happen next. So how will these lessons express themselves in future? Um, I am of the view that uh, any recurrence of uh, disturbances of that nature 
can only result in more careful planning and, and better calculation, uh, thereby achieving the desired results to a greater extent uh, than the spontaneous situation we had last year, for instance. And you believe that by these means you will bring about a real change of the society? I see this as only an expression, one form of an expression of discontent inside. I'm of the view that uh, the whole change process is going to be a protracted one in this country. It depends entirely on the degree to which the nationalist government is prepared to hold on to power. And my own analysis is that they are wanting to hold on to power and fight with their backs to the wall. Now, conflict could only be avoidable if they were prepared to avoid it. Those who are at the seeking end, that is, those who want justice, who want an egalitarian society, uh, can only pursue their aspirations according to the resistance offered by the opposition. And if the opposition is prepared to fight their best to the war, conflict can be avoidable. Now, we as uh, BPCI, um, I'm a member of the Black Conscious Movement. I was a member of BPC before I was banned, and um, now I have been, I'm told, appointed as um, honorary president of BBC. Now, the line that BBC adopts is to explore as much as possible uh, non-violent means within the, within the country, and that is why we exist. But there are people, and there are many people, we have despaired of the efficacy of non-violence as an effort. They are of the, of the view that the present nationalist government can only be unseated uh, by people operating a military wing. I don't know if this is the final answer. I think in the end there is going to be uh, a totality of effect of a number of change agencies in operating in South Africa. I personally would like to see less groups. Uh, I'd like to see groups like ANC, PAC, and the Black Consciousness Movement deciding to form one liberation group. And it is only, I think, when black people are so dedicated and so united in their cause uh, that we can effect the greatest results. And whether this is going to be through the form of conflict or not will be dictated by the future. I don't believe for a moment that we are going to willingly drop our belief in the non-violence uh, stance as of now. But I can't predict what will happen in the future in as much as I can predict what the enemy is going to do in the future. Can you guess at all at the number of years uh, the change might take? That's a very difficult exercise. I don't want to get involved in that kind of exercise. Some people say five years, others say ten years. Um, I think we are not at a stage yet where it is possible to fix a precise timetable. When you speak of an egalitarian society, uh, do you mean a socialist one? Yes, I think the, there is no running away from the fact now that in South Africa there is such an ill distribution of wealth that any form of political freedom which does not touch on the distribution of, uh, proper distribution of wealth will be meaningless. Uh, the whites have locked up within a small minority of themselves the greater proportion of the country's wealth. And uh, if we have a mere change of face of those in governing positions, what is likely to happen is that black people will continue to be poor and you will get a few blacks filtering through into the so-called uh, bourgeoisie. And our society will be run almost as of yesterday. So that for meaningful change to occur, there needs to be uh, an attempt at reorganizing the whole economic pattern and, and economic policies within this particular country. Uh, PPC believes in a judicious blending of uh, private enterprise which is highly diminished and uh, state participation in industry and commerce, especially on uh, industries like mining, uh, gold, diamond, asbestos and so on like forestry and of course complete ownership of land now in that kind of judicious blending of the two systems we hope to arrive at a more equitable distribution of wealth mm. yeah, but you see a country <coughs> sorry, 
clearly you see a country in which black and white can live uh, amicably uh, on equal terms together. That is correct. We, we see a completely non-racial society. We don't believe, for instance, in the so-called guarantees for minority rights, because guaranteeing minority rights implies the recognition of portions of the community on a race basis. We believe that in our country there shall be no minority, there shall be no majority, there shall just be people. And those people will have uh, the same status before the law, and they will have the same political rights uh, before the law. So in a sense, it will be a completely non-racial non egalitarian society. But will the vast number of blacks, after all their experiences, yes. be able uh, to live a life without giving vent to feelings of revenge, of... Uh, uh, yes, we, we believe it is the duty of the vanguard political movement which brings about change to educate people's outlooks. I mean, in the same way that blacks have never lived in a, a socialist economic system, they've got to live, to learn to live in one. In the same way that they've always lived in a racially divided society, they've got to learn to live in a non-racial society. They've got many things to learn. And all these must be brought to them and explained to the people by the vanguard movement, which is leading the revolution. So that uh, I, I've got no doubt in my mind that uh, people, and I know people in terms of my own background where I stay, are not necessarily revengeful, nor are they sadistic in outlook. Now, the black man has got no ill intentions for the white man. The black man is only incensed at the white man to the extent that he wants to entrench himself in a position of uh, power to exploit the black man. But beyond that, nothing more. And we don't need any artificial majorities, any artificial laws to entrench ourselves in power because we believe once we come into power, our share number will uh, maintain up there. So we do not have the same fear that the minority white government has been having all along which has led to these many laws, you know, designed to keep them there. As you know, the main argument of the government is always that the black man just isn't uh, on a civilizational level at present mm -hmm. to pull his full weight politically. Yeah. And now, uh, do you think of a one-man, one-vote franchise? Yes, we do think so, entirely. Entirely one-man, one-vote, no qualification whatsoever, except the normal ones which you find throughout the world. And you think that the black man, in fact, is perfectly well able uh, the black man is well able and the white man knows it. I mean, the irony of that kind of situation is that when the white government negotiates so-called independence for the so-called trans guy, they don't speak in terms of a qualified franchise. In the trans guy, every trans guy has votes, you see? And uh, you get white nationalist politicians arguing that this is a system which is going to work for the trans guy. But somehow, when it comes to the broader country, the blacks may not vote because they don't understand the sophisticated, you know, um, economic factors out here. They understand nothing. So they, they need to operate at a different sort of level. Now, this is all nonsense. It is meant to entrench the white man in the position in which he finds himself today. We will do away with it altogether. There will be a completely non-racial franchise. And um, the black and white will vote as individuals in our society. Well, um uh, this is all fascinating. As an outsider, visitor, uh, I can only say that my feeling is that this is bound to be a very long and probably a very bloody road. There is that possibility. There is that possibility. But as I said earlier on, it will be dictated, you know, uh, purely by the response of the Nationalist Party. If they've been able to see that in Rhodesia, Smith must negotiate with the leaders of the black people in Rhodesia, yeah, uh, Hold it. yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, I think conflict is unavoidable given the predictable response from the present system. Uh, and this conflict can be pretty generalized and extensive and protracted. Uh, my worst fear is that working on the present uh, analysis, conflict can only be on a generalized basis between black and white. Uh, we don't have sufficient groups who can form coalition with uh, blacks, that is, groups from the whites at the present moment. But uh, the more such groups come up, the better to minimize that conflict. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much.